Last year, Showtime produced and aired a four-part documentary called We Need to Talk About Cosby. And I haven't seen it. I don't plan to see it. And if this clip, which went viral this week after the series aired on the BBC, is any indication, then there's uh, no reason for me to change that policy. I will not be watching it. In the clip, we're treated to some insight from Sonali Rashatwar, who is a non-binary sex therapist who goes by they, he pronouns, which means that uh, she's a female. So her personal pronouns are all of the pronouns except the right ones. So she'll take any of them as long as it's not right. Um, And if those credentials don't impress you, though, I should also mention that she is very fat. She's a very fat person. And I can say that because that's how she identifies herself. She calls herself on her website, the fat sex therapist. And the website, uh, speaking of, also contains this description of her work. It says this, Sonali Rashatwar is an award-winning clinical social worker, sex therapist, adjunct lecturer, and grassroots organizer. Based in Philly, they are a, they are a super set, wait, super set, I think I might have put that in. They are a super queer, bisexual, non-binary therapist and co-owner of Radical Therapy Center, specializing in treating sexual trauma, diet trauma, racial or immigrant trauma, and South Asian family abuse. Okay, so if you suffered from North Asian family abuse, I guess you're out of luck, I guess. Uh, Now, most of this sounds like nonsense to me, but she does deserve credit, at least, for her efforts to fight diet trauma. I mean, as we can see, she has clearly been extremely successful in staving off trauma related to dieting. So if you're worried about being traumatized by dieting, she's definitely the person you want to talk to about that. Um, But that isn't really the point we need to focus on, Uh, especially because her website is absolutely filled with this kind of gibberish. Here's just one more sampling. Here's what it says. Sexuality is morphed by the pressures of compounding oppressions, which is why I offer solution-focused workshops that affirm the colonized experience and contribute to the radical imagination of our decolonial sexual futures. We must unlearn the ways that we have been forced to exist within what is considered normal and begin to imagine the ways that we can flourish outside of those pressurized systems. By aggregating individual forms of sexual resistance, I am able to weave together workshops explaining broader ideas of collective sexual liberation. Centering conversations around pleasure and body liberation, we can better imagine how joy will lead us to revolution. Now, that all reads as if it was written by some kind of random woke word generator. Um, leftist buzzwords are combined with academic sounding jargon and weird psychobabble with little attempt made to form them into actual coherent sentences, which is how you end up with gems like the phrase aggregating individual forms of sexual resistance. Whatever sexual resistance is supposed to be, I'm not quite sure how it can be aggregated. This is what happens when a person with an IQ of 95 uses a thesaurus to try and make her writing sound more intelligent. It's a, it's, a, it's a common pitfall of a certain type of dumb person where they are given to believe that in order to sound intelligent, you must be unintelligible, which is like the opposite of how it's supposed to work. But this is perhaps more information than you needed, uh, needed to know about this person, but it does help to put the clip into context. Though the context won't make it any less horrifying than it is. Uh, listen. If we actually grapple with the fact that sex negativity is what causes this type of behavior, then we could create a world where in a, a sex, a idyllically sex positive world, someone is able to pay conscious women to come and be drugged so that I can get my kink out, my, my fetish on having sex with unconscious people. There's a consensual way to do that. Oh, there you see. Bill Cosby, he wasn't a serial rapist, that she, as she explains. He wasn't that. Uh, or if he was, it wasn't his fault. He was the victim of a world that isn't sex positive enough. If only he had had an outlet to, as she says, get his kink out, then he wouldn't have been forced to drug and rape so many women. Now, this is, of course, disgusting and depraved. Uh, it's no wonder that a woman with No concept of physical health would also have such deluded ideas about what is sexually and morally healthy as well. But she does help us to see, I think, two important points. First first point is this, that we need to get back to kink shaming. They were told we're not supposed to kink shame. You don't shame anyone's kink or their fetish. You don't shame it. No, no, no. Actually, uh, actually we should. There should be a lot of shame being heaped on uh, many of these kinks and fetishes that are, are, you know, uh, 
celebrated these days. In our culture, we have this notion that a person's kinks, you know, their sexual habits and desires are automatically above criticism. The worst thing we could ever do is critique or interrogate someone else's sexual proclivities. Sona Lee is simply standing at the logical endpoint of that idea. If we mustn't kink shame, if we must pretend that all sex is good or at least morally neutral so, neutral, so long as it's allegedly consensual, then even rape becomes its own, as she says, kink that just needs a healthy outlet. But this is not true. Um, the premise is fatally flawed. Sex is not a morally neutral playing field. How could it be? Okay, sex is an interaction with another human being. There's, there's no interaction to begin with that's morally neutral. But in this case, it's the most intimate sort of interaction. It involves the most intimate sort of physical contact. You are engaging with someone who is in their most vulnerable state, both physically and emotionally and spiritually, and in every other way. Uh, sex is an act laid in with consequence, potentially serious consequences. Of course, there are proper ways to go about it and improper ways. It's not just a forum to get your kinks out. The problem with many kinks that we are uh, supposed to accept or even celebrate these days, including the one that the fat sex therapist is talking about, though certainly not just that one, is that they don't respect the dignity and God-given value of the other person involved. Okay, So often, these are things that are degraded and disgusting and perverse. There are proper ways and improper ways of interacting with someone in even a casual environment. But sex is not casual, no matter how much we try to pretend otherwise. And so if there's a right and wrong way for even casual interactions between humans to go, about, to, to go then how much more must that be the case for sexual interactions? There are right and wrong ways. A kink uh, may be performed consensually, but it can still be deeply disordered and degrading. And therefore, we should criticize it. Even more, we should ask why. Okay, If you have a weird, gross sexual fetish, you should be asking yourself why you have it. What is it about this depraved activity that you find so appealing? You see, we live in a society that is obsessed with desire. You know, we're always, it's, we, we, it, all we care about is what someone desires, what they want. So we're obsessed with desire, and yet we're so incredibly incurious about it at the same time. We never ask why a person has a certain desire. All we know is that they desire what they desire, and so they should go off and try to obtain whatever they desire. But there are some desires that should not be pursued. In fact, there are many such desires, and those desires are warning signs. In the case of a desire to you know, have sex with unconscious people, as this woman is talking about, the warning sign is more like an alarm bell blaring at 100 decibels, indicating that something is deeply wrong in the person's mind and soul. We should be investigating what is wrong rather than telling people to ignore it in the mindless pursuit of satisfying whatever disgusting urge enters into their head. Second point, all of this begins to make sense as soon as we realize that consent-based morality Okay, morality that is merely consent-based is not just wrong, but catastrophic to any culture that tries to adopt it. Case in point, our culture. There has to be more to morality, especially sexual morality, than mere consent. Obviously, all sexual activity must be consensual. Obviously, it's a horrible evil to force yourself on someone violating their consent. But the problem is that that is where our culture wants to end the conversation. But it shouldn't be the ending. It's just the beginning of the conversation about what entails you know, a healthy, um, good sex life. Okay, but, but what our culture says is that if the sex is consensual, then that's all there is to say about it. There is nothing else to say about it. All sex is good so long as both people, or however many people, verbally agree to participate in it. The flaw in this idea is that it, it, it emphasizes, it's not that, it's not that it emphasizes consent, but that it only cares about consent. Consent is the beginning and the end. And that's how you wind up with people like Sona Lee trying to find a consensual way for men like Bill Cosby to sexually violate unconscious women. 
That's indeed how you end up with a lot, lots of disordered, harmful, damaging sexual behavior that is nonetheless accepted because it's consensual. What we need to finally understand is that consent is not the one and only consideration. While all non-consensual sex is automatically evil, it doesn't follow that all consensual sex is automatically good. Because sex can still be degrading, demeaning, dehumanizing, even when the participants are engaged in the act by choice. We see that consent on its own is a flimsy and insufficient framework for sexual morality. This is also why people will, will, you know, very often will, these days, will engage in in consensual sex with some random person that they met, you know, on Tinder or whatever. And then they'll wake up the next day feeling regret. This happens all the time. They agreed, they consented, and yet now they regret it. In fact, a, a person engaged in consensual sex, not only regret it, but can wake up feeling used and exploited because they were used and exploited. They consented to being used and exploited, but they were still used and exploited. And they used and exploited their partner in equal measure. That's what a lot of consensual uh, sex and casual sex, that's what it is. It is the mutual agreement for two people to use and exploit each other and then discard them. So you've got consent. There's no question about it. But does that mean we can't we can't say anything else about to, to criticize that you're treating each other this way? Like maybe it's not good for you. Maybe it's not good for the other person. Maybe this is not a path to fulfillment and happiness in life. You know, the thing is, a situation like that, neither person was raped, but they did indulge in something shallow, loveless, and degrading. And having casual sex, they allowed a stranger to use them as a glorified masturbatory aid. They feel embarrassed and vulnerable now. They feel hollow. They feel despair. They feel regret. These feelings are inevitable when you divorce sex from love and from devotion and from fidelity and from concepts like dignity. And that should be the framework. Rather than merely asking whether the sex is consensual, we should ask whether it is loving, whether it respects the dignity of the other person. And the great thing is that this framework will will obviously include consent, but then it goes much farther beyond that as it needs to. This is something that's obvious to me and obvious to many people. But of course, to someone like uh, Sona Lee, who makes it her whole life and her whole business to talk about sex, she can't see this insight at all. And that is why she is today finally canceled. 